Hello, fellow book lovers, both readers and writers. I am Maddie Dowernpole. I write the Anne Kinnear suspense novels and suspense shorts and the Lizzie Ballard thrillers. And I also write, speak, podcast, and consult on the writing craft and the publishing voyage as the indie author. And this is my video series, What I Learned, where I ask authors two questions related to their latest book. What did they learn from that book that they would like to share with their fellow writers? And what did they learn from that book that they would like to share with their fellow readers? And today I am here with Michelle Chenard. Hey, Michelle, how are you doing? Good, how are you? I'm doing great, thank you. To give our viewers a little bit of background on you, Michelle M. M. Chenard is the USA Today and Publishers Weekly bestselling author behind the Detective Joe Fournier thrillers, the standalone psychological thriller, The Vacation. She loves animals, coffee, amateur genealogy, and anything to do with Halloween serial killers or the zombie apocalypse. And her upcoming Amateur Sleuth series is the Serial Killer Guide to San Francisco, which comes out on September 24th, 2024. And so today I am asking Michelle the two what I learned questions about the Serial Killer Guide, starting with what did you learn that you would like to share with your fellow writers? Okay, so what I would like to share with my fellow writers about this one is this is the manuscript that converted me into becoming an outliner rather than a pantser. I was never a pure pantser in my Joe Fournier series, right? Even from the first book, I always had sort of like, I would call them my guideposts. I had like five to 10 beats that I knew I had to, to hit, you know, and then I would sort of work from that and pants to a certain degree. So if you want to call that planting or, or what have you. But for this book, I when we sold this book, I, it actually wasn't completely written. We sold it on proposal. And so I had to come up with an outline for it. So I sat down and, and I had to figure out, you know, what an actual outline and a full synopsis was for it. And it was the first time I had done that. And I learned in that process, because I was always terrified of that, because I was always like, well, I'm going to lose the spontaneity and there's something amazing about, you know, things that happen when you're writing that you, you don't foresee, but that just pull everything together. And uh, I actually might have a PhD in, in basically learning and memory and child development, learning and memory. So I, I'm a big believer that our brain is doing things and coalescing information that, you know, we're just not even consciously thinking about. So to sort of pin myself down to that outline, I was always afraid of what that was going to do. And it turned out that, that it was not the case at all. It was actually quite liberating and it freed me up to have, you know, discoveries and in, in, in other ways. And I was able to shift and adjust. And ever since then, now I, I just, I never, I've written two books since then and I, I won't go back to not having an outline before. So I would say, even if you think you're a dedicated planter, cancer, can't plants or whichever of those. <laughs> and you think that you would never outline, give it a shot once just to see, because for me anyway, it turned out to, to, to be really transformative. Yeah. I think a lot of people are just put off, off by the time out, term outline. And I wrote an article called creating a story frame. I love nautical metaphors for the writing craft and the publishing voyage. And so that idea of having like a foundation to work with made a lot of sense to me. And for me, it was it it was something that gave me a sense of comfort as a writer, not a sense of being hemmed in because you can change the outline if you want to. Yes. And another thing for me is the, the process of generating ideas. I never thought was going to really fit the way that I generated ideas. And I, I belong to Masterclass. And if so, if anybody belongs to Masterclass, there's a class on there by the Duffer Brothers. They're the ones who did Stranger Things. And. So I was like, okay, I love that show. Let me see what they have to say. And they actually walk you through the process of how they create their, their series. And they show you how they brainstorm in real time. And I found it personally just hugely generative. So anybody who ever asks me about that, I say, if you get a chance, go, go check out their class on Masterclass. Well, it's interesting on your shelf. I'm just trying to see if the red book with a white front is is Save the Cat. Yeah, it writes a novel. Yeah, Save yeah. the Cat writes a novel. Because when you we're talking about beats, you know that immediately makes me think of that. Is the is the Duffer Brother approach? How does that compare with the Save the Cat writes a novel? It's it's really different. I mean, they they actually walk you through things like just sitting down and creative brainstorming and coming up with a thousand different ideas and then figuring out which way you want to go with it and and focusing on character drive and 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 letting those kinds of things take you. 
they can do a much better job of explaining than I can. I literally go back and rewatch it every time I start a new book. So that shows you how much I love it. But what they do do is they talk about for each of your subplots, for each of your characters' arcs, you need to have, you know, like some something akin to five beats for them because you've got, you know, you're setting up what they, where they start, where they finish and the problems that are happening along the line. And I've also found that really helpful to think in terms of not just my main plot, but also each of the characters' arcs and each of the beats and plot that out before I start has has also been super helpful too. That is super helpful. It makes me both want to re-enlist in Masterclass and also go back and watch Stranger Things, <laughs> which I started and then I got freaked out because it was like children in peril. And I was like, I don't know, but yeah. I, should, I should forge ahead with it. That's so cool. So that's a lot of good information for your fellow writers. How about your fellow readers? What did you learn that you'd like to share with your fellow readers? Okay, so my my fellow readers. So the Serial Killer Guide to San Francisco, the premise, just very quickly, because it, it's relevant, I promise, is that my main character, Capri Sanzio, she, is, she gives true crime tours of San Francisco. She is also the granddaughter of a man who was convicted as a serial killer. She thinks he's innocent, and she has all, it's always sort of been her life stream to to show that he was innocent, but her father is really against her digging up the the past. But then some copycat murders happen using her grandfather's methodology. And so she ends up embroiled in it and becomes a suspect and just to clear herself. And in the process of clearing herself, she has to explore whether or not her grandfather was actually guilty. One of the things that when I was doing a lot of different research, and I say research because I love anything true crime anyway. Of course, that's part of the reason why I'm, I'm going with this approach. But one of the things that I think really fed into this was a, a, a Canadian documentary. It was a Canadian team, two guys who were looking into a murder. And what they found when they were doing this, so they're like, oh, let's get on the trend and do this thing and a documentary about this, was that there, were, there was nothing they could do and no place that they could go that didn't touch people's lives in a way that was unexpected. And particularly the emotions it brought up, the, you know, yeah, your, your, your relative might be dead, but the fact that they were considered as a suspect for this murder, that's painful and it causes trauma. And I think that that's one of the things that sort of gets lost in true crime. I, th I think that true crime is really valuable, right? Where we're getting eyes on cases that have been, you know, just for reasons of resources or whatever, maybe were never solved. And Things have been solved that way. So I'm a huge proponent of it. But I think that one of the things we have to keep in mind is that real people have real lives and those real lives are still being touched, whether those are family members of the suspects or family members of the victims. And so that is one of the big themes of this book was I learned, especially from that documentary, a real appreciation for how, you know, if your father was convicted as a serial killer, what does that do to you? And then what does that do to your relationship with your children? And how do you go out and face the world? And what does it feel like to have people showing up on your doorstep after 20 years going, I'd like to talk to you about this again, you know? And, yeah. and we want to believe that everybody wants to find the truth. Um, and of course, everybody wants to find the truth. But at the same time, when is it okay for somebody to just be like, I, I, I don't, I can't deal with this anymore. Please leave me alone. Yeah. So those are questions that Capri has to struggle with in dealing with her father. And and her her need to kind of dig up this case. So just that perspective is something I'd like to share with my readers because it wasn't something I'd really thought about before I had seen this, the documentary that sent me down that path. It's also interesting to think about kind of the opposite of that, which is that I'm always surprised that the people who agree to talk to true crime podcasters, you know, this is Joe Schmo. His story kept changing over the years following the disappearance of so-and-so. And now we're sitting in his kitchen chatting with it. But I was like, why? Why would somebody do that? Well, the, big, it, the best example of that rate is Will Durst, right? Who actually called that the director wanted to do a documentary. And then in the course of the documentary, ends up confessing to the crimes. Yeah. It's, what were you thinking? I mean, I still can't figure that out. Yeah. The, all of those examples are fascinating psychological studies that you could give to a protagonist or a secondary character or a walk-on character that would make a reader really go, hmm, I wonder what's going on there and I want to read more to find out. Yes. Yeah. That's so cool. You know, I had one other sort of unassociated question as you were holding up the book. 
If someone said there's a book called The Serial Killer Guide to San Francisco, guess what the cover is going to look like? There would be two ways you could go. You could do like, you know, the blood dripping down from a knife kind of thing. Oh, but you have like sort of a lighthearted graphical representation there. Did you, I'm assuming that your publisher came up with that. Were you surprised by how they decided to uh, market the book from the cover point of view? Well, this, unlike my Joe Fournier's, which are, you know, are darker and you can tell that you know, yeah. from the, from the covers, this is, this is a humorous mystery. So I tried to put in humor and of course it's yeah. dark humor and I try to keep it respectful, of course, because of the yeah. content, but because it's something, I wanted this to be more fun and a little bit lighter. So yes, they 100% came up with the cover, but I think they nailed it. I think yeah. I couldn't have done a better one myself. So I love that. Yes, there's blood, you know, and it's the dots there and there's a knife. But it also conveys, I think, that this isn't going to get super dark. We're not yeah. going to have like in one of my books, I have a person has to cut off their own arm. You know, that's yeah. not going to happen in this series. It reminds me a little bit of the covers for the Thursday Murder Club. The same kind yes. of thing that it's it's about yes. murder. But you can tell by exactly what you're saying. The cover conveys an important message to the people who are thinking about it. And unlike the Finley Donovan books, I think, I, it, you know, the tone is a little bit more like those. And I think the cover is, you know, in that same kind of putting up those same genre cues. So. Yeah. So cool. So interesting. Well, Michelle, thank you so much for chatting. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm, I'm super intrigued. I think our listeners will be, too. So please let them know where they can go to find out more about you and everything you do, including your upcoming book online. My website is www.mmchenard.com. It actually works if you just go www.michellechenard.com as well. And you can find me there, all my links to social media, all links to books and anything like that. And you can sign up for my newsletter. And not only do I send out cool stuff, I think it's cool, about true crime and other stuff. But this year, I happened to have collaborated with a bunch, bunch of other authors. Maddie might be one of them. Maybe. To give away, we're all giving away some free stories. So if you sign up to our newsletters, you get awesome free stories too. Great. So glad you mentioned that as well. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you so much.